Church of Church. Good to see you. Won't you stand up, raise your voices, and worship with us? God of the promise, God of the future, you see beginning and end. God of the rescue, God of the breakthrough, how great is your faithfulness. You're not done yet. No eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, no one could ever comprehend. Your word will be enough, your promise we will try.
Holy Spirit dwells inside of me. I will live my life to glorify my King. I am a vessel for His majesty. Oh, praise the Lord. Come bless the Maker. Lift up your voice.
asked the question he says Lord where can I go to flee from your presence and he goes on to say if I ascend to the heavens you are there if I go to the grave you are there if I dwell in the remotest parts of the sea even there your hand it leads me and guides me you see church there is no place we can go where God would not already be, because that is who he is. So make no mistake, he is here this morning. He is in this place. He is working and moving and touching and healing hearts, because that is who he is. So if you're here this morning and you are desperate for a touch from him, because maybe you haven't been seeing it or maybe you haven't been feeling it. Know that we pray with you. This is the season of epiphany. This is the time of year when we really do seek God to make himself known. And it is our prayer for you this morning, church. It is our prayer for all of us. But make no doubt, he's moving, he's doing, because that is who he is, amen. Let's join together and let's pray that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, why don't you take a moment and just greet some people around you before you find your seats this morning. While they're doing that in the room, as always, I want to welcome all of you who are joining with us online. Thanks for being a part of the Celebration family. Thanks for joining with us and worshiping and wherever it is that you're enjoying service this morning. We'd love for you to say hello to each other as well. And as always, be blessed by the rest of our time together. Well, as you're finding your seats this morning, I would love to take a moment to welcome any of you who might be visiting with us for the first time this morning. Welcome. We're so delighted that you found your way through our doors, or maybe you found us out there online somewhere. Celebration Church is what's referred to as a convergent church. And what this means is that we strive to blend together the three mainstreams of Christianity. So the evangelical, the charismatic, and the sacramental. 
Our hope is that we provide you with a very modern worship experience, but one that's blended together with some very meaningful traditions that come out of the earliest days of the church. If today is your first time with us, we do have one very small ask of you. You'll notice in the seat backs that there are some cards called a connection card. And on that card, it asks for some very basic contact information. If you would be willing to fill that out during the service and then just drop it with our ushers on the way out, we would be so grateful. We want you to know that we're not gonna hassle you, we're not gonna sell off your information or anything weird like that, but we really would love the opportunity to simply send you a letter or maybe it's an email thanking you for spending this time with us. And then in that communication, we would love to give you just a little more information about the church, as well as some next steps you can take if you decide that you might like to find out even more. But please know it truly is our honor to have you spending this time worshiping with us this morning, and we hope that you will truly be blessed by your time here as well. Um, I do just have one quick note before we get to the news this morning. Um, this is Man Camp Week. I can't even believe. Here we are. So this Thursday through next Sunday, we've got a bunch of guys from the church who are heading out to Camp Unalaya to spend a couple of days just building a relationship, getting to know each other, getting to know the Lord more. So if it comes to mind, we would love for you to be praying for all those guys for their safety and for just a tremendous time with the Lord as well. Everything else you need to know is in the news. My name is Christian and welcome to Celebration Church. We hope you'll make plans to join us Wednesday, February 14th at 6.45 for our traditional Ash Wednesday service. We will have a time of worship and reflection followed by a light meal of soup and bread. Additionally, we'll be holding Wednesday night services throughout the season of Lent. Children's ministries will be available. We hope you'll mark your calendar and plan to be with us. If you are interested in making a pot of soup for Ash Wednesday and throughout Lent, please stop by guest services in the lobby. One of the most common questions we hear from those of you who have been around Celebration Church a while is how do I become a member? We're glad you asked. Step one of the Celebration Growth Track is all about membership. At step one, you'll hear about some of the ins and outs of our church, learn what we believe, and our leadership structure. To sign up and for more information on times and locations, visit the church website. Life is better together. With groups starting this week, there is still time to meet your people. Find all of the groups we have to offer online at celebrationchurch.tv slash groups, or join the Dream Team and find a serve spot in the lobby today. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the rest of the service. Good morning, welcome to Celebration Church. Let's all stand together as we recite together the Apostles' Creed. This is our statement of faith. This is who we are and what we believe at Celebration Church. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who for us and for our salvation was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the fellowship of believers, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Good to see you here this morning. Today we're doing uh, baby dedications. Hence the collar. Next service? Or here? Okay. I just work here. I don't know what's going on. We are in a season of epiphany. What is an epiphany? It's when all of a sudden the lights go on in your head and you go, ah. Oh, that's what that means. Always reminds me of that 
those TV commercials. Oh, I could have had a V8, right? You thought about, oh, I forgot about that. Oh, something that you're working on. You're working on a problem, and all of a sudden, the answer pops into your head. It is an epiphany. And this is extremely true when it comes to uh, the matter of faith. Because none of this really makes sense until you can have an epiphany of who Jesus is and what all of this is about. And our prayer is during the season that God would uh, clearly speak into people's hearts and minds and that things will become clear to them because only God can make it clear. We can make the case, we can preach and share as I'm doing now, but until God turns on the light in people's hearts and heads, uh, they don't get it. There are people who have gone to church all their lives who've never had an epiphany, who never get it, to them, it's all about mechanics and pushing this button and twisting this knob and doing this. And it's, it's all mechanical to them. They've never really had a heart change, a faith experience. D did we lose lights over here in the middle? Is it just me? Like everything's lit except here. I can't see you people. These are the naughty people. That's where, that's, that's where they go. <laughs> Don't mind me. I have the attention span of a fly. Okay, <laughs> Mo moving on. During the season of Epiphany, we're going to read this morning from, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, accounts in the Gospels. This is in the Gospel of John. And uh, we start uh, chapter 9, verse 1. This is early in Jesus' ministry. You'll see as we're going through this, a lot of people, who, Jesus, what, what? They didn't quite get it yet because he's new on the scene. And it says here, as uh, Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, that's a little comical to me. I feel bad for this guy, not because he's blind, but uh, he seems to be invisible to people. They're saying this right in front of him. And they're discussing, and you'll see this, this goes throughout the story. It's like they're talking about him. It's like, hello, I'm right here. All right? So right in front of him, say, look, look at this guy. Why was he born blind? What, what bad thing did he or his parents do? Because it was common uh, to assume that something, if something bad happened to you, that you had it coming. Uh, there's people who still think that way today. Sometimes people in their own lives, if something bad happens, I must have done something wrong. God's punishing me. Uh, is that possible? It is possible, not likely in most cases. You say, well, why do bad things happen? Uh, even to good people, because we live in a fallen world. This is a world, this is not heaven. It's amazing how many times I'll talk to people who, you know, they're nominal in faith and they don't know that much about God, and they'll they say, well, I believe heaven is here on earth. <laughs> really? Sucks to be you, because this is awful down here. This is not heaven. We are in a world, on a planet, that starts out saying, I don't want to do what God tells me to do. I want to sin. I want to do my own thing. It's a world that is rebelled against God. Uh, the powers of Satan are through this entire world of ours because of rebellion and sin and hatred and unforgiveness and all the nasty things that people want to do and are drawn to. As a result, we live in a world, it's a dangerous world. And things happen, sometimes bad things happen just because it's just the way it is. If, if you're riding a motorcycle too fast around a corner, you're probably gonna crash, okay? If you're driving your car and you fall asleep, you're probably gonna crash. If you eat terribly, which too many of us do, and uh, don't ever move, you're going to have physical problems. And people, then they kind of point to God. God, why'd you let this happen? Hello? <laughs> God didn't do that. You did that. We do that. If you're not careful, you will get hurt. That's why we teach our children, be careful. Be careful, don't touch that, it's hot. You know, life is full of dangerous things. The good news is someday we die and get out of here. And as Christians, people of faith, we get to go to heaven and be with Christ forever. And we're not gonna live in constant danger, but we do here. So bad things happen even to good people. And uh, I know every time something happens bad, someone dies prematurely and everybody's wondering, you know, why God, why God was... <sighs> You know, it's, it's not like God goes around killing people. This is the world in which we live, all right? 
uh, I'm, I'm a pilot. You know, when you're flying an airplane, you have to maintain a certain speed. If you don't, it will fall out of the sky. And God had nothing to do with it. <laughs> you have a very stupid pilot who's not paying attention. That's why most of these crashes happen on coming in on landings. I've, I've told you this and now people are paranoid to fly now, but uh, uh, taking off in an airplane is, is easy. A one-legged monkey can fly an airplane, taking off. Navigating today is extremely easy. Back in the day, we had to have all these things. That, now you got all these fancy GPSs. I love it. You push a button, it tells you how to go. It'll even fly the airplane, which I like, all right? Uh, landing, that's tricky. If you don't do that just right, <laughs> you can kill yourself. So, uh, and that's why the pilots have to maintain certain speed. And a lot of times you'll read about, oh, plane, it dropped short, it's coming. Why? Somebody wasn't paying attention. Even highly trained pilots, that's why it's good to have two pilots, because one can yell at the other, hey, speed it up. Because if you're not paying attention, and it's not God doesn't smack the plane down, it's people aren't paying attention. We live in a dangerous world. So anyway, you know, something bad had to happen. Lord, this guy's blind. Why is he blind? Uh, who sinned. <clears throat> and uh, Jesus replied, and neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God may be displayed in him. Uh, so what he's basically saying, you know, sometimes things go south so that when you answer, God shows up in prayer and God gets glorified. So this is this situation. This is for the glory of God. And then Jesus says this, as long as it is day we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. This is yet another version of do whatever. We preach a series of sermons. What does God want me to do? What does God want me to do? A common phrase we hear from Christians all over the world. What does God want me to do? I've shown you from the scriptures. He wants you to do whatever. Quit becoming obsessed about what he wants you to do. You see somebody who needs help, you help them. If someone's hungry, you feed them. If there's a need, you respond to them. Look, be aware of the whatevers. Do whatever, whatever your hand finds to do. And Jesus says here, uh, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Why? Do good while you have the chance. Because there's a day coming where you won't be able to do anything anymore. Okay? So do whatever. Be productive for the kingdom of God. So after saying this, and the guy, again, he's standing right there. Uh, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Now, that's a little gross. Uh, my wife has an absolute aversion to spittle. <laughs> you want to gross her out? Spit. <laughs> she doesn't like it. She says, oh, she comes unglued by it, you know. But so Jesus gets down, and he doesn't just make mud, he makes spit mud and sticks it on the guy's eyes. And then he tells him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So the man went and washed, and came home seeing, miraculous. So he says here, he puts his spit mud on his eyes, go wash. I'm thinking, if he hadn't put spit mud in my eyes, I wouldn't have to go wash. But he didn't say that. And uh, he goes and he washes. And as he washes, all of a sudden, he has his sight. And it is amazing. Now, the question, people say, well, why, why mud? Why would he do this? Actually, if, if you read through the Gospels, you see that Jesus constantly is changing up how he prays for people, constantly uh, adjusting uh, uh, why is that? Because he wants to keep us from focusing on a formula. There's something about people when it comes to faith, they want a formula. I mentioned that earlier about people who have never really had a, an epiphany. All they know is that do this, say this prayer, and you'll hear, do that. You know, that is all very mechanical. Uh, God wants us to avoid formulas. Even uh, strong, charismatic faith people, if you watch them, listen to them, they're, they push for formulas. You gotta do this, gotta quote this verse, you gotta do this, and, and, and people lock into it because everybody wants a formula. Why well, wants a formula? Do you know why? Because uh, formulas are appealing because then you don't really have to have faith. Just do the formula and you'll get your answer. A lot of people wait and they're listening to preachers on TV and radio. They wanna find the formulas for these different things. And while they can share some helpful things, and I get that, this isn't about formulas, okay? God doesn't just wait for a certain formula for we respond. People of all kinds of it. You know what a, a formula I discovered when I moved to Green Bay? 
And I'd never seen it before anywhere in the country. I'm sure people do it all over the place. But uh, there is this uh, thing, if you want to sell a house, have you heard this? You, you take a, a statue of St. Joseph, you, you dig a hole and you bury him in the front yard with him facing the house. Anybody ever heard of this? Yeah. Very odd, okay. I've actually had highly intelligent, educated people tell me to do that when I was trying to sell a house when I came to Green Bay. I said, even when I was an evangelical pastor. Yeah, what you're supposed to do is take a stash of and poor Joseph, he's upside down all the time. So they're sticking him upside down in the front yard waiting because this is how you sell a house, which is absurd. It's just, what is it? It's a formula. People want a formula. Tell me how I can do the formula. How do I do it? How do I stick, stick Joseph upside down and, and then it's going to happen. I say, Pastor, you're, you're picking on Catholics. I'm not picking on Catholics. Even Catholics, if you look at it, don't believe that nonsense. I found this in a website, a Catholic website, catholics365.com. They write, it is not a pious devotion to bury statues of St. Joseph. <laughs> it is actually an evil practice. And we should be careful not to use religious articles superstitiously. They have no power. If you want to sell your property, pray. <laughs> what a shock. Okay, we don't want to pray. We don't want to have faith. We want to have trust God. Tell me what to do. Tell me how to do it. What button can I push and stuff? You know, and, and people are like, you know, even we travel all over the world doing these marriage things. That's what people are looking for. You know, what's, what's the formula? Uh, how, how do I, I don't know, quit being a jerk. You know, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> it's really rather simple. <laughs> Talking to a couple this weekend. And uh, sometimes we struggle. I say, let me guess. Every time she does X, you get mad. He goes, yeah. I said, every time you do Y, he gets mad. Yeah, what should we do? Stop it. Stop irritating each other. You know, it's like <laughs> stepping on the same landmine. I've used this analogy before. We've heard this. They Emotional, people step on the same emotional landmines over and over again and get blown to smithereens and they're shocked when it happens. Well, stop stepping on the landmine. Well, I shouldn't have to. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> You're gonna lose your legs. You know, in the real world, when people find landmines, they mark them. Stay away, danger, danger. Danger, Wills Robinson. <laughs> Those are all the old people laughing. They remember that? <laughs> TV show, Lost in Space. Anyway. What am I talking about? I don't even know what I'm talking about. So, uh, so anyway, so this guy's walking, all of a sudden now he, now he can see. Now his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? And some claimed th that he was. And others said, no, he only looks like, it, like him. They're saying this in front of him. He's going, hello, <laughs> I'm the man. <laughs> This poor guy. It's like nobody recognizes him. Notice he's there. They keep discussing about him. No, I'm, I'm the guy. And they said, well, then how, how were your eyes opened? And he replied, the man they called Jesus. See, he doesn't really know anything. A lot of them don't know anything at this point. Some do, some don't. Jesus is new on the scene. This, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. And he told me, go to Salom and, and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked. He goes, I don't know. <laughs> he was blind. He didn't see him in the first place. He has no idea who Jesus is. Doesn't know what he looks like. Doesn't know nothing. All right. So then they brought him to the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the religious pinheads of the day. These are the people that's this very religious. And everything, you know, got their formulas about everything in life. And they're, they are legalistic pinheads. All right. So they bring him to the Pharisees, the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. And this is key. Why? Because these pinheads uh, would take things and make things more complicated. Religious people still do this to this day. The Bible says one thing, and then they add to it, thinking they're helping out God. I got news for you. God doesn't need your help. All right? 
Uh, they're legalists. I've used this analogy beforehand. A legalist is, for example, you, you have a rule, your children should not play in the street. It's a good rule. Don't play in the street. A legalist will come along, well, then you really shouldn't play in the yard. Because if you play in the yard, you'll be tempted to go into the street. So now the kids are locked in the house. And another legalist comes along and says, really, they shouldn't be upstairs, they should be in the, in the basement, because they might look out the window, be tempted to see the yard, and go into the street. So you get a bunch of pasty-faced, chubby little kids living in the basement because of stupid people. And we have this religious problem all over in America this morning. And it's shocking the number of churches that do this. And when I point it out to them, they all get rattled. Or they, you know, I tell them, you know, when we do communion, we, we use real wine. I said, why do you use real wine? I said, because we still haven't found that verse that Jesus said uh, he, t- he turned the water into Welch's. And we're still looking for it. It's got to be there. This many people can't possibly be wrong. They all know it. But they're just really, uh, why? They don't want alcoholism. (laughs) So apparently in their world, if you take a little thing of wine, there's a chance you might turn it into a raging alcoholic. And I said, no, we're just little things of wine. We're not doing shots of Jack Daniels. (laughs) Goodness gracious, but that's a legalist, right? You got to stay away. (laughs) So the rule was the Sabbath. You're not supposed to work. You're not supposed to do any, any work. It was a good, it's, it's, it's a way of honoring God for his, his Sabbath and a good thing for men. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. The Pharisees messed everything up. So what they did is they'd look for any little thing that you would do. And if you exercise too much energy, you're breaking the Sabbath. It's like this still to this day in Israel. Uh, because of the serious, you get a seriously religious Jew, they won't do anything. They can't even switch on a light switch. Because if you put on a light switch, that releases energy, and then you're working, and you're violating the Sabbath, which is absurd. So now, instead of being free to relax, they actually live in fear. That's what religious people do. They make you more afraid than really help you. And, uh, and in fact, the way, if you're in a hotel, the way you get around in a hotel is they, on Saturdays, they pre-program the elevators so that the elevator stops at every, door, every floor continuously. So the way that it works, you wait until the elevator gets to your floor, you get in it, and then you wait till it eventually gets to the floor you want, and you get out. Okay, heaven forbid, you push a button. All right, because that's working, and that's energy. So they wanted to know what Jesus did. So, verse 15. Therefore, because it was Sabbath, the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, and I wash, and now I see. Ah, ah, the Pharisees want to know what he did. He did something. He made mud. You mud maker, how dare you make mud? And, and they get mad. They don't care the guy had a miracle. They don't care that all of a sudden he can see. All they know is that he did something on the Sabbath. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Why wasn't he keeping the Sabbath? Because he did something. He made spit mud. And you can't do anything. And others said, well, uh, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. And then they turn again to the blind man. He says, what do you have to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the guy replies, he's, he's and I, I'm thinking, he'd probably say this more like a question. He's a prophet? He doesn't know anything. He's not proclaiming he's a prophet. This guy doesn't know anything. He doesn't even know what Jesus looks like. All he knows his entire life, since he was a baby born, hasn't seen a thing, and now he's an adult man, and now he can see. What do you think about this guy? He's a prophet. And they still don't believe that he'd been blind and he received his sight. This can't be real. This can't be real. This can't be real. So they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? His parents say, well, we know he's our son and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or how he opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. <laughs> He's of age. He'll speak for himself. Now, this is because they didn't want to get too involved. People, I don't want to get involved because the rule is if you acknowledge that Jesus was the Messiah, they'd kick you out of the synagogue, which is what it says here. 
verse 22, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That's why the parents said, he's of age, you ask him. So a second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth. We know this man is a sinner. And this guy goes, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. I love this verse. This is the ultimate testimonial of anybody of faith who truly encounters Christ in, in their life. And a lot of people think, I'm uncomfortable. I, don't, I know I should probably share my faith with other people, but what if they ask a question I don't know how to answer? It doesn't matter. You, don't have to, you may not understand much of anything in the Bible. The one thing that you know that is true that nobody can take away from you is once you were blind, but now you see. I've experienced Christ. He has changed my life. And just like here, how, how, did, how did he do it? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I put my faith in Jesus, and now I'm a different person. My life has changed. This dark cloud that was over me is gone, and I'm walking in his glorious sunshine now. It is the person with an experience is never at the mercy with a person with an argument. Don't be afraid of people's arguments. You know, if you got a $100 bill in your pocket, and I'm going, no, oh, no, you don't, no, you don't. <laughs> what do you care? You know you got the $100 bill, right? And don't be afraid of people's arguments. And a lot of times people will just come up, they, they pre-rehearse arguments against people of faith. And, uh, and they're kind of trick questions and, and you don't really know how to answer. Don't worry about that. Look, the one thing you know that is true, I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind and now I see. I have experienced Christ in my life. It is the strongest thing you can say to somebody. Whether or not you can answer all the questions about the Bible is really not the best thing you can. You might be the best person to explain all these things. That's not the most powerful thing you can do. The most powerful thing is share your story of how you were blind, but now you see. That is the story. That's what we sing in these songs where we praise and worship God because of what God has done in our lives. People come along, well, what about all the uh, contradictions in the Bible? And, and, and you, don't, you, don't, you don't have an answer for that. By the way, if anyone ever asks you, what about the contradictions in the Bible? Just ask them. Which ones? <laughs> they don't know. That's all they know to say. I run, oh, I know it's in there somewhere. I thought, you read the Bible and they come and show me. And uh, who knows, maybe they'll have an epiphany. So anyway, he says, oh, look, whether this guy is a sinner or not, I don't, one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see the ultimate testimonial. Then they ask him, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I've told you already, and you did not listen. So this guy's really getting rather bold, right? He's getting a little irritated at this point. He has made his case. Nobody's listening to him. First of all, they don't even believe it's him. Isn't this guy who's born blind? No, it can't be. Yeah, it's me. Nobody's, he's a little frustrated as they're getting all over his case. And, uh, he said, I told you already, you didn't listen. Do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? And they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We're disciples of Moses, for we know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And the man answered, well, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from. Yet he opened my eyes. And then he says, we know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Chances are what he's doing here is he's quoting their own words at them. Okay, they were the ones who were always putting down sinners. You know, there's one thing they couldn't handle about Jesus. He hung out with sinners. He hung out with alcoholics. He spent time with prostitutes. He, does, he spent time with the people none of these guys would give the time of date. They stayed away from them. They were the ones who make comments like, we know God does not listen to sinners. Which is really, that's kind of a trap. What do you do? If you're a sinner and God doesn't listen to you, you can't even come and ask God to forgive you. You're doomed. But this is what the Pharisees taught. So when he says, we know that God does not listen to sinners, he listens to the godly person who does his will. He's just quoting back into their face what they say. And he says, nobody's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And to this they replied, you are steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. <laughs> Poor guy. 
Well, Jesus had heard that they'd thrown him out. And when he found him, he said to him, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? Tell me so I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, loud enough for the Pharisees to hear, for judgment I've come into this world so that the blind will see and that those who see will become blind. And some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and said, what, are we blind too? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin because you claim that you can see your guilt remains. It's easy to... Uh, claim that to, uh, you're, you can really see everything when in fact oftentimes one cannot. There's no humility with the Pharisees. It's an amazing, I love this story. It's an incredible story of how this guy interacts with these people. He feels like he's a nobody. He's a, you ever feel like you're a nobody nothing? Welcome to church, all right? Welcome to Celebration Church. We're a congregation mostly of nobodies. You don't even know the guy sitting next to you unless he's married to you. I hope you know him. You know, we don't know everybody. We don't know everybody in here. You know, so we gather together, just we people who turn our hearts to God, and we celebrate the fact that we can come to God, even though we are sinners, and that He does hear us. We're going to celebrate now our time of communion. This is where we celebrate what all this is about. Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of the world, and uh, He gave us this sacrament where uh, we gather together uh, and uh, we take his, uh, the bread and the wine, the body and the blood of Christ. You say, oh, is that literally the body? <laughs> you know, people just, again, religious pinheads argue about things that nobody needs to argue about. You know, if I, if I show you a picture of my grandchildren, say, uh, look, these are my grandkids. Nobody would here think, you know, his grandchildren are a piece of paper. They get it. Oh, these are my, oh, these are your grandkids. So, I mean, uh, don't get caught up into some of these questions that people struggle with. Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, that's what we call it, this is what we do. And we partake in the sacrament of communion, the Lord's Supper. But the Bible says before we do this, we should pause and examine ourselves. Uh, so I'm going to ask everybody to bow your heads in, as I pray a prayer of forgiveness over all of us. Heavenly Father, before we partake of the bread and the cup this morning in an obedience to the scriptures, we pause to examine ourselves. If we have sinned against you in thought, word, or deed, something we did that we should not have done, if we've not loved you with our whole heart, if we've not loved our neighbors as ourselves for the sake of your beloved son, Jesus, we ask you to forgive us of all of our sins. We thank you that, God, you do hear us when we pray that we are not locked up from your glory. And if we just simply humble ourselves to you, you always make things right in us. And as heads are bowed and people are reflecting, maybe you're here this morning thinking, you know, I've, I've never really done this, but maybe you're having an epiphany. All of a sudden you, you, you get what this is all about. You know, all you gotta do is ask Jesus in your own words to come into your life and to forgive you of your sins. And you can start taking your first steps of faith with us here this morning. Now I'm going to ask the ushers to go ahead and pass out the communion. Just take the bread and the wine. Outside drink is grape juice if you don't want wine. But uh, don't take it right away. Just hold it and we'll take communion all together after everyone has been served.
pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bread and the wine that we partake of this morning. We ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would sanctify these elements and make them to be to us the body and the blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, take this and divide it among you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's all stand together and join in this song. And you may be seated. If this morning was the first time in your life you experienced an epiphany of faith where you understood Jesus dying on the cross for you and you asked him to come in and forgive you, I have a book I'd love to give you. It's called New Beginnings. It's a great little book that'll explain getting to know God in your life. Uh, if you step by the guest services counter and just say, hey, can I get a copy of that book? Uh, they'll give you one absolutely free. Those of you watching at home online, you can go to our, our website, celebrationchurch.tv and uh, just say it where it says faith at home and I said yes to Jesus a form will pop up just give us your name and address we'll mail you the book at no charge those of you watching overseas and go to the same place just give us your email address and we will send you a link where you can download the book onto your e-readers again all at no charge now this time we're going to be having a baby dedication there it is okay ready to go uh, Pastor Keith's going to join with us as these couples come along with their uh, the little ones and their witnesses who will act as godparents over them. All right, here they come. <laughs> All right, so we have Emmett and Beckett, Hannah, 
Adeline, Madeline, and Desi. All right, so bring them up. Two sets of twins. Yeah. Ooh. Cool. It's one way to grow a church. All right. Twinning is winning. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming, guys, and being part of uh, of our dedication today. I want to draw your attention to some scriptures, just two of them out of uh, clearly the Bible. So Deuteronomy is the first one. It says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commands I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. And then Ephesians 6, 4 says, says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So I want to challenge the parents today, as well as these witnesses, these God parents, to love God with every ounce of your fiber, your energy, all you can to to teach these children to do the same. As you love God and each other, you will model before these children the kind of love you will want them to have someday in their home. And even more importantly, when you demonstrate love in your home, you help them to understand the kind of love that God has for them. So you parents, do you hereby declare your desire to dedicate yourselves and your children to the Lord? If so, please respond by saying, we do. All right, at this time I'm going to ask the mother to place the baby in the arms of the father or godfather as a sign of respect to the father as the biblical head of the home. And now the mother is going to light three candles. All right, so you get your little candle dealy bobs there. That's the official name, dealy bob. You can light it. Get your, get on fire. (laughs) There you go. All right. Now first, uh, they're going to light the blue candle, which represents the life of the child. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, Proverbs 20, 27. Next, light the red candle, which represents redemption through the blood of Christ. For the Lord will light my candle, the Lord will enlighten my darkness, Psalm 18, 28. And then finally, you're going to light the white candle, which represents the dedication of this child to a life of purity before the Lord. You are the light of the world, Matthew 5, 14. All right. Hi, guys. I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's looking right at me. Hi. Who are these creepy people? (laughs) Hi, sweetie. I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be blessed. Hi, girls. I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be blessed. And this last guy with no socks, or no shoes. Were you kicking him off? Is that the noises I heard? <laughs> I say, let it all hang out, man. I anoint you. Yeah. Despite. <laughs> Who is this guy? I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be blessed. All right? Good boy. You're a good boy. Give these guys a hand. <laughs> Don't touch me. Uh, Let's all stand together as we wrap this all up. uh, If you would like any prayer personally for uh, healing or something in your life, you can come up afterwards and I'll happily pray for you. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so influence our wills that we might be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you. And then use us, we pray, as you will, and always to your glory and the welfare of your people. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Oh, by the way, offering. I just got a text. (laughs) The way we do our offerings here is you can use the envelopes on the seat backs in front of you, put your gifts in those, and hand them to an usher on the way out. Of course, a lot of people have... uh, 
if you're a regular attendee, have signed up for recurrent giving, it just happens automatically, or you can use your phone and point your camera at that QR code and it'll take you right to where you give your financial gift. Anyway, let me bless you now. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a great day. See you next Sunday morning. Bye-bye. God of the promise, God of the future, you see beginning and end. God of the rescue, God of the breakthrough, how great is your faithfulness. You're not done yet. No eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard. Seeking God in my dreaming, you put a song.